Welcome to the Flag Bearer Channel. This is Little Known Black History Facts. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Blacks in Aviation, from Robbins Airport to Air Atlanta. The first black owned and operated airport in the United States was in Robbins, Illinois. Robbins Airport was the birthplace of black aviation. Its founders were pivotal in the history of African Americans taken to the skies. Few know about the city's courageous black pilots who changed aviation history. When flying was still a novelty, these men and women took to the skies and in the process helped open the door for blacks to train and fly as pilots in World War II. In the 1920s and 30s, Chicago was home for the growing black aviation community a place of opportunity that was central to black exploration and innovation. The surrounding Chicago area was where some of the most influential black pilots in history opened the first black owned airport. This legacy started with the work of Bessie Coleman, who spent her short adulthood in Chicago. In 1921, Coleman became the first black American woman to earn a pilot's license. The black men and women pilots who came after Coleman all attributed their work to her, wanting to continue what she started. Chicago's significant role in the black aviation movement began with two young men who shared a passion for flying. In the 1920s, Cornelius Coffey and John Robinson met in Detroit, Michigan, where they were working as auto mechanics. Both men wanted to learn to fly, having been inspired by Bessie Coleman, who overcame racial and sexual barriers to become a licensed pilot. They applied to the Curtis Wright School of Aeronautics in Chicago and were accepted. However, upon learning that the two mechanics were black, the school revoked their admission. Coffey sued for racial discrimination, and Robinson got a job as a janitor at the school to eavesdrop on classes. While on the job, he listened in on classes and at home he read books and papers that he had collected from the school's trash cans. While emptying the trash one day, Robinson found a flight magazine with an advertisement for a Heath parasol, a build-it-yourself airplane that could be purchased for about $300. Coffee, Robinson, and the men they worked with in Robinson's auto garage built the plane. Unable to afford a proper engine, they retrofitted one of Coffee's motorcycle engines. Upon its completion, someone working with Coffee and Robinson persuaded one of the school's instructors to inspect the plane and to take a ride. Impressed by its craftsmanship, the instructor informed his colleagues of Robinson and Coffee's remarkable achievement and encouraged their admission to the school. The impressed administrators of the school called a meeting with Coffee and Robinson. If Coffee dropped the racial discrimination suit, the school would establish a special night class for them to take. The men accepted and were asked after graduation to teach other black students how to fly. In 1929, Robinson and Coffee became the first black students to be enrolled at Curtis Wright. Later, they broke a second barrier by becoming the first black instructors of a certified aviation school in the United States when Curtis Wright hired them to teach 35 black students in night classes. Cornelius Coffey was a certified pilot and flight instructor. He was best known for his exceptional skills as an airplane mechanic. Coffey had also been credited as the inventor of the carburetor heat control, which enables planes to fly in cold weather. At the time, black aviators were not allowed to fly out of airports used by whites. Chicago would not permit a black owned airport, so Robinson and Coffey took their idea to the young, predominantly black town of Robbins, Illinois, whose mayor, Samuel Nichols, was enthusiastic about the prospect. His daughter, Michelle Nichols, would later become an actress on Star Trek, portraying Lieutenant Uhura. The airport was constructed with volunteer laborers who leveled forests, removed boulders, and constructed a single wooden hangar. Robinson and Coffey set out to establish an airfield for aspiring black aviators. Along with the black students from the school, they formed the Challenger Aero Club. The club members secured the land in Robbins, where they constructed an airstrip with their own hands. 
With the help of Janet Harmon Bragg, the first black woman to earn a commercial pilot's license, and Willa Brown, the first black woman to get both a pilot's and commercial license, both Bragg and Brown were trained by Coffey and Robinson and became their colleagues. Janet Harmon Bragg purchased an airplane so that she and others could fly. Robbins Airport served as a training facility for aspiring black pilots until it was destroyed by a violent windstorm in 1933. The Challenger Aero Club then moved its activities to Harlem Airport on Chicago's southwest side. It was there that Willa Brown joined the group. Brown had worked as a teacher before moving to Chicago. She had developed a love for flying after meeting John Robinson and spent a lot of time at Harlem Airport. Brown became the face of Chicago's group of black aviators. She was instrumental in establishing a relationship with the Chicago Defender newspaper, which increased visibility for black aviators' activities in the city and across the country. Willa Brown and Cornelius Coffey established Coffey School of Aeronautics at the airport. Hundreds of men trained under Coffey, many of whom later became members of the Tuskegee Airmen who flew in World War II. Robinson, Coffey, Brown, and their colleagues not only contributed to the advancement of black aviators in Chicago, but they also inspired African Americans across the country to participate in aeronautics. Among their many national achievements is their successful push to integrate black pilots into the U.S. Army Air Corps. An adventurous aviator, John Robinson spent the later years of his career as a fighter pilot in the Ethiopian Air Force and became known as the Brown Condor. Upon his return to the U.S., he received a hero's welcome for his role as the only American volunteer in the Ethiopia-Italy conflict. In 1954, Robinson died in a plane crash in Ethiopia. The first Black-owned airport and flight school was short-lived. After the windstorm destroyed the airport, Coffey and Robinson went their separate ways. The airport was never rebuilt, and today only a historical marker in a vacant lot stands in its place. The two men involved in the airport continue to serve as pioneers in aviation. Dreams of Blacks in Aviation would inspire a young Michael Robinson Hollis to found and establish Black-owned Air Atlanta Airlines. Michael Robinson Hollis incorporated Air Atlanta in 1981 when he was 27 years old. Even though it wasn't the first Black-owned airline, the scale and ambition of Air Atlanta were unmatched. After sharing his vision with family members, Michael's mother and godmother gave him their $35,000 life savings to jumpstart his airline dream. That was the seed money that he used to attract the first serious investment. In total, the Hollis family invested $100,000 into Air Atlanta. After raising funds from his family, Michael was able to attract investments from larger organizations. Air Atlanta took flight on February 1, 1984, with its maiden scheduled route connecting Atlanta and Memphis. The founders, Michael Hollis and Daniel Colbert, both attorneys, envisioned a carrier that provided efficient air transportation and stood as a symbol of empowerment for the black community. The airline quickly gained positive attention. Air Atlanta was the first airline that was largely owned by black people. Based in Atlanta, Georgia, the airline flew to a dozen major cities including Detroit, New Orleans, New York, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. Despite a promising few years, 1987 proved to be a challenging year for Michael and Air Atlanta. The tragic crash of a Midwest Air DC-9, similar in size to Air Atlanta 727s, had a negative impact on the perception of flying. Although Air Atlanta was not directly involved, the incident had a ripple effect on the public's perception of similar carriers. Further complicating matters, the stock market crash that same year created a volatile economic environment. It affected businesses across various sectors and the airline industry, already struggling with thin margins, felt the strain. Financial troubles for Air Atlanta came to a head when despite having raised $80 million throughout its operation, Air Atlanta couldn't secure an additional $10 million necessary for its survival. To add insult to injury, unsupported rumors began circulating that Air Atlanta was involved in drug smuggling. These claims, 
though unfounded, tarnished the airline's reputation at a time when public trust was paramount. Facing this insurmountable pile of challenges, from financial difficulties to a tarnished reputation, and lacking the financial and public support needed to weather the storm, Air Atlanta was forced to file for bankruptcy in 1987. Air Atlanta had flown 3 million passengers before it shut down after filing. The dream that Hollis had nurtured was grounded. In 2012, Michael Hollis died at 58 years old, leaving behind a legacy of ambition, determination, and innovation. Until next time, if you like little known history facts as I do, please like, share, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Press the bell to be notified of future uploads. Thank you for watching.